we'll move to the person who is nominally the fourth speaker, that's Jingyi Jessica Li. So Jingyi is, a, uh, is an associate professor in statistics primarily and also biostatistics, human genetics, computational medicine, secondary at uh, UCLA and director of the Center for Statistical Research for Computational Biology, won numerous fellowships and awards. And uh, uh, Jingyi, the floor to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. So I'm going to go to the full screen. And I'll do the sharing again, it's a little tricky. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. And today I'm going to talk about our simulator for single cell RNA seq data. And it's supposed to capture gene correlations well. So why do we need a simulator? There are two main reasons. The first is that we need a simulator for biologists to choose among many experimental protocols to see which one generates the data that best suits their analysis goals. For example, there are full length protocols and tag based protocols. They have their relative advantages and disadvantages. And also given the protocol, how to optimize experimental parameters is another question. For example, how many cells should I sequence or what sequencing depth should I target? These are also, these are, can also be determined by a simulator. Another major reason is that we need a simulator to benchmark computational methods. There are many methods developed for the same analysis, such as cell clustering. And how do we know which one is better? We can use a simulator because it's a synthetic data carries um, ground truth for us to do the benchmarking fairly. So there are many simulators that has been developed in the field. We summarize an ideal properties of simulators in six aspects, including being adaptive to different protocols, preserving genes, capturing gene correlations, and allow cell number and sequencing depth to vary, easy to interpret, and being efficient in terms of computational time and the training number cells. So in this summary, we see that most simulators do not satisfy this capturing gene correlation property. Only a few of them may roughly satisfy this, but it's not clear. And also a majority of them cannot allow cell number or sequencing depth to vary. Motivated by this, we, we developed SC Design 2 to satisfy all the six properties. So this is a very brief overview of the method. So the input is very simple. We just need a real gene by cell count matrix and the cells are labeled by cell types or cell clusters. And then we will train a joint gene distribution for each cell type or each cell cluster using a technique called copula. And then given the user specified sequencing depth and cell number, we would generate synthetic data for each type or cluster. And as we see here, when we specify a very low depth, the counts will be low. And using the synthetic data, they can guide experimental design and benchmarking computational methods. So this is a very important plot to show our advantage in capturing gene correlations. So this is a violent plot showing the distribution of gene correlations in real data. Here we use Kendall's tau because it is a rank-based correlation, more robust than Pearson correlation. And it is also better for capturing ties than Spearman correlation does. That's why we pick it. And here we see that in those existing simulators, the three of them that can roughly capture chain correlations have some issues. SEGAN is a deep learning method, but it's very slow and difficult to train. ZimbWave and SparseSim cannot really capture the negative correlations well. And this is our SE design too, but without a copula technique, it does a poor job. After using copula, it does a very good job. This is a more concrete illustration of some gene pairs. So between these two pairs of genes, we see that the real correlation is very negative, but ZimbWave and Sparsen do not capture that. While SC Design 2 synthetic data capture well the negative correlations. Furthermore, here are the gene correlation matrices. We see that for the real data, the matrices are like this. This is the synthetic data for SC Design 2, very similar. But look at ZimbWave sparsing, not so similar. Without copula, we cannot do the job. 
This is for 10x data. Further, let's look at SmartSeq2 data. We have an even bigger advantage. So real data is like this, synthetic data by S-Design2. ZimWave sparsing without copula, they do not do the job. So we show that it's very, it's very realistic, our simulated data. And further, this is a T-SNE visualization of real data, synthetic data, and other simulators results. So this is individual data sets visualization. We overlay them to, to mix them to make a joint visualization. This clearly shows that our synthetic data in red is most similar to the real data in black cells. But if you look at without copula, zim wave, sparse sim, the differences are very clear. Further, in PCA visualization, we see that it again confirms the similarity between SC design to synthetic data with real data, but not so for ZimWave and SparSim. So beyond single cell RNA-seq, our SC design 2 can also generate synthetic data for other single cell count-based technologies, including MERFISH and PCI-seq. These two are spatial transcriptomics technologies and here we're showing PCE visualization, real data, synthetic data by S Design 2, by ZimWave, by SparSim. We see that by looking at the colors, for example, the pink ones, we look like the real data the most. While here, the pink cells are divided into two positions. For PCI seq, we see similarly that here we mimic the real data by having the purple cells right here but the other two simulators have the purple cells right here. So we confirm that our real, our synthetic data are realistic. So what about applications? The first application is cell clustering. We use our SC Design 2 to help benchmark two, two clustering methods, SURAP and SC3. So the first type is to vary the total sequencing depth and see how the clustering accuracy change. Expectedly, the accuracy should improve as the, as the sequencing depth increases and it should saturate, right? And we see this effect. And for the cell number, we will expect that the accuracy to first increase and then decrease. Because when we have too few cells, we cannot cluster well. When we have too many cells, then each cell is too vague, given a sequencing depth. Therefore, the accuracy will decrease. Our results confirm this trend. And further, we show that the optimal cell number here and the optimal sequencing depth here are not actually the real data sequencing depth and cell number. This suggests that SC Design 2 can guide future experimental design in optimizing these experiment parameters. And further, the visualization of synthetic data and the clustering results of Sura SC3 and the true cell types confirm this trend. So another interesting result is that SC3 has better performance than SURAT when the sequencing depth and cell number are optimized. But SURAT is more robust. It can actually still identify clusters at a low depth and at many cells. I think this is reasonable given the methodology because SC3 is an ensemble method. So it actually is computationally more intensive. That's why it cannot handle too many cells. Further, for rare cell type detection, another application, we benchmark two methods, FIRE and Gini class 2. So first, as we expected, the rare cell type detection accuracy increases as the sequencing depth increases. But interestingly, for Gini class 2, we see an unusual drop in accuracy. And this is confirmed by the visualization. The reason is that Gini class 2 mistaken one cell type, which is not a rare cell type, for the rare cell type. So that explains the sudden jump. And for the varying cell number scenario, again, we see a rise and a drop. So similar to the previous comparison, our benchmarking results confirm that when we are at the optimal sequencing depth or cell number, Gini class 2 gives a better performance. However, the fire is more robust. This is also reasonable given their methodology design. Fire is based on 
outlier detection, which doesn't require clustering as a previous step, but Gini class two is based on clustering. So whenever there's an issue with clustering, it will not perform well. So as a summary, I introduce our essay design tool as an interpretable simulator that generates realistic single cell gene expression data with gene correlation. The name was inherited from our previous simulator essay design, but that one couldn't capture gene correlations. A very big advantage of essay design tool is that it uses probabilistic modeling. The model is very transparent and interpretable. It can offer experimental guidance and computational benchmarking. This is our R package. And for our future work, we want to extend it to accommodate continuous cell trajectories. So I want to thank my two PhD students, Tian Yi and Dong Yuan, who are at UCLA, and my former PhD student, Vivian, who graduated last year and is now an assistant professor at Rutgers and our funding agencies. So finally, I want to give a one slide preview of our other method, pseudo-time DE, developed by Dong Yuan. So the method is to identify differential expressed genes along pseudo-time, and the advantage is about its validity of p-values. So this QQ plot shows that our pseudo-time DE can really generate p-values that follow uniform distribution under the now, while existing methods, including traceq and Monaco 3, doesn't do well in this aspect, and these other methods from bulk rna data couldn't do well. And with this value p-value, pseudo-time DE can actually control the FDR well. And given the FDR control, it can give the best power. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jingyi. Uh, great to see more accurate simulation methods. We have, uh, actually, before I jump into the questions, uh, Mikhail, I think, is still not here. So we actually have 12 bonus minutes. So you can take your questions slowly. And then anyone who has questions, uh, we'll start with Jingyi and then anyone who has questions for the first two speakers, you can come back and ask them if they were not answered. And Jingyi, you're welcome to talk slowly when you answer. Okay, so, I will do that. Okay. Our, our first question is, uh, I'm curious, this is from Lee Guo Wei. Uh, I'm curious mm -hmm. about how does SC Design 2 perform on data sets with complicated cell type composition? Okay, that's a very good question. So if I return to this slide. So yes, you can see that here we are or actually handling multiple cell types together. But yes, our previous step, so as an input to SD design, we need to have the cells categorized into cell clusters or cell types. So as long as we can do this step well, then we can make sure the synthetic data look like real data. So even if the clustering result may not really correspond to real biological cell types, for example, a cluster may not, so two clusters may be labeled as the same cell type by their marker genes, but based on data, they look like two clusters and that's okay for assay design too. We can just input them as two cell clusters and generate synthetic data separately for them and then mix them together. So the input is one count matrix, including cells of different types and the output is still one count matrix with mixed cell types. So I don't think that's an issue. Excellent. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I think there's another question in the chat box from V the pool. So okay. how does yeah, yeah how ahead. does SD design to simulate the joint spatial location? RNA, oh, I see, for Murfish data. Actually, we didn't use the spatial location information at all. So in this figure for the Murfish data, oops. Yeah, here, for the Murfish data and PCI-seq data, they both carry spatial locations. But in our simulation, we didn't, we didn't change that. So we didn't actually simulate the spatial information. We just simulate their gene expression data. And here, the visualization is based on gene expression only. But yeah, we can consider that in the future for sure. Thanks, Jingyi. So I, for some reason, I'm unable to see Vipul's question. So it's possible there are other questions as well that I cannot see. Um, mm. Right. Uh, so, so if you see them, please read them out and answer them. OK. Yeah, I think Vipul just sent the same question again, but I just answered his question already. OK, great. Yeah. 
Oh, all right, while we're waiting, I, I have a question about, um, um, yes, having too many cells, that makes things worse. I, I didn't catch that. Why, why does that happen? Yeah. Oh, the reason, yeah, that's a very good question. I want to explain this further. The reason is that we are fixing the total sequencing depth. So there are only so many number of reads. When we get more cells, then each cell will get more, fewer reads. So that's why fewer genes will be captured per cell. Uh, okay, so it's, it's just a sequencing depth. Okay. It's just a sequencing depth, yeah. It's just a balance, Got it. yeah. Got it. And, and what, what happens if your, your, your ground truth uh, is, is wrong? What if, what if your ground truth is wrong? It just comes from some algorithm, right? So oh, actually here, basically, yes, we actually learned the data characteristics from real data. But when we simulate data, you can consider that the cell types or cell clusters we use to simulate new cells because the synthetic cells are generated. Then you can consider the cell types they are generated from as ground truth. I understand, but let's say your yeah. real data, you're assuming somebody has to give you the cell type labels in the real data, right? Sometimes somebody has to give us the cell type label or we have yeah. to do cell clustering and then label exactly. each cluster, yeah. Right, so if that original clustering itself is wrong, how does that affect your method? Okay, yeah, so if the original cell cluster is wrong, what we can only say is that um, we still try to simulate varying number of cells and varying sequencing depth from that wrong truth. So the truth is wrong, but the, the simulation procedure is still trying to mimic the the experiment. So basically you can still evaluate how your method will perform in relation to the wrong truth. But I think, yeah, but whether, but but I think the issue is that we never know the, whether the truth, there is truth, right? That's why we're doing single cell experiments. So, but, but I think the benchmarking is still meaningful that because we are comparing those methods based on the same set of truth. Okay. And, and yeah. um, for example, sequencing depth, so that, you know, you, you can simulate mm -hmm. higher sequencing depth than what the data had. Exactly. But for lower sequencing yeah. depth, I guess you can just downsample the real data, right? So have you tried comparing it's, your it's, simulations to just downsampling the real data? That's what a lot of people are doing, right? So they downsample the real data. And, but here, one thing I think maybe advantages in our approach is that when we try to learn the gene join distribution, that distribution is actually not, um, so basically we, that distribution can actually scale up or scale down based on the total sequencing depth. So that's a step we incorporate into our simulator. So basically I feel like if you trust the distribution, for example, marginally, we will fit each gene to fit to follow a count distribution. And we choose from four count distributions, which are Poisson, zero inflated Poisson, negative binomial, zero inflated negative binomial. So these four distributions have been verified that actually describe the data pretty well. And we use a data-driven approach to select for every gene, which distribution describes its expression the best. So therefore, I think probabilistically, we can think, okay, this is more reasonable than just downsampling because downsampling actually ignored part of the randomness in the, gen in the generation of single cell gene expression data because you are downsampling every cell or every gene by the same amount. So you are doing a, just a proportional downsampling. But while when we are generally new cells, we're actually mimicking some random nature in the generation of reads, which is not captured by simple downsampling. Understood. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, Jingyi. I want to give a chance to people who have some questions sure. for the other speakers as well. Who yeah, should I stop sharing my screen? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So uh, anyone have any leftover questions for Wanlu or Wataru? Uh, feel free to type them in right now. May I ask a question for our second speaker, Wataru? By all means, we have yeah. time. As, 
Yeah, my, my question is, um, so when you evaluate the accuracy, the spatial reconstruction accuracy, it's not based on individual cells, based on your explanation just now. It, is it not based on individual cells, but based on regions? Uh, Lataru, you're, on, you're muted. Uh, sorry. Yes, that's right. Um, because uh, we have um, only uh, known data. So, um, so known, known data means you have only regions. So not individual mm. cells. You need to, if you need, need an individual cell location, you need to generate it from a more feature. Uh, was, I, I forgot the name, but the other fish methods or something. Mm. I see. But when you do the reconstruction, is it based on individual cells or regions? So when you use the SOM, self-organizing map? Yeah, um, um, our algorithm can use uh, a CRNS data, so individual cells are input. Okay, I yeah. see. So basically, we, we, we are doing a clustering, okay, based on the self-organizing map. Mm. Mm. I see, I see. Thank you, Wataru. Uh, um, Jingyi, one more question for you. Uh, sure. Yeah. From Guangdong Peng. D does SC design to impute the dropout? Will it also oh, add yeah. details oh. for trajectory inference? Um, yeah, these are very good questions. questions. Yeah, very two very good two questions. So dropouts, no, we actually we do we don't do imputation at all, but we actually simulate dropouts as they are in real data. So, so essentially the zero will be, so the zeros will be in synthetic data. The dropout phenomenon will be like in real data. So we just want to make the data realistic. Yeah, so that's why we didn't do imputation. Yeah, although we did an imputation method ourselves <laughs> earlier. And the second question is that for the trajectory inference. Yes, that's another active research area in my group. As I say in our future work, our immediate step is to allow SC Design 2 to simulate cells that follow a continuous trajectory. Yeah, so that's our next step. And furthermore, I think what is really advantageous of our approach is that because we fit a probabilistic distribution to the genes, right? So I think that's very useful because it will give us a likelihood function which can be of other use. So I think that's very advantageous compared to other approaches like deep neural network, although they can simulate cells, but that cannot be used for likelihood calculation. Uh, absolutely, I can imagine all kinds of other applications for, for the model that you learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Uh, any questions for Wan Lu uh, about the first talk? Uh, I, I, actually, okay, we have two minutes. I'm going to use those two minutes. So, so Wan Lu, uh, any any insights from your uh, evolutionary analysis of of these transposons? Uh, any patterns you you could conclude, um, or any trends? Say, ERVs behave this way. Um, lines behave that way, you know, one is evolutionarily disappearing, the other is very variable, uh, anything like that? Do we still have Wan Lu here? Oh, we lost Wan Lu. Okay, that, in that case, uh, we, we can, and there's no more questions, we can wrap up the session. Uh, oh, one last, one more question. Uh, from Xiao Chun Wang uh, uh, to Wataru, uh, how is the computation time for computing single cell RNA seq data, like for thousand, thousands of cells? I think yeah, thousands of cells. Okay, um, thank you for the question. That's an excellent <laughs> question. Actually, it takes a long time. Um, why? Because. Uh, um, each each time we calculate a SOM uh, mapping. So for but uh, uh, at the same time uh, we are trying to extract the, the best set of uh, genes. So uh, this this needs a, a combinatorial problem, combinatorial optimization problem. So that phase we need a lot of calculations. So uh, the, sorry, this is unpublished data. So we are now uh, 
um, actually uh, ta tackling this, this uh, issue with uh, lots of uh, methods uh, for combinatorial optimization. For example, hill climbing or, uh, you know, um, Markov chain, um, MCMC, or other methods to optimize the gene set. So it takes a long time. Thank you, Wataru, and uh, perfect timing. So we're at the end. I'd like to thank uh, all three speakers, Wan Lu, Wataru, Jingyi, a uh, very stimulating session. Uh, we'll take a 15 minute break now and then come back for the COVID session after that. Thank you, thank you all. And that'll be plenary. Thank you.